Well, thanks for coming to Discovery Class. Springtime is wedding time. Did you get married in the spring? I did. Today I'm going to talk about a wedding. And it's an invitation to a beautiful wedding. And guess what? You're invited. Let me read you the story as found in the 22nd chapter of the book of Matthew. Here's your wedding invite. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who threw a wedding banquet for his son. He sent out servants to call all the invited guests, but they wouldn't come. He sent out another round of servants instructing them to come as guests. Look, everything's on the table, it's all ready. The prime rib, all set for carving. Come to the feast. They shrugged their shoulders and they went off. One went to weed his garden, another to work in his shop. The rest with nothing better to do, they just beat up on the, the messenger. Well, the king was outraged. Then he said to his servants, we have a wedding banquet all prepared, but no guests, nobody's coming. The one I invited wouldn't go. So he said to his servants, we have a wedding banquet all prepared. The ones I invited weren't going. Now I want you to go out into the busiest intersections in town and invite anyone that you can find to come to the banquet. The servants went out onto the streets and they rounded up everyone they laid their eyes on. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And so the banquet was on. And every place was filled. Do you know what the average cost for a wedding is now here in North America? Now these stats come out of USA Today, it's a newspaper, last week. Here's what the average wedding costs class comes from your wallet if you're getting married. 29,000 bucks. That's a lot of money. When I got married way back then, it's almost 60 years now, we didn't have any money. As a matter of fact, my wife and I, we tended on our honeymoon. But you know, when these kids come back after spending 29,000 bucks on a party, they have to buy a fridge, a stove, a dishwasher, a microwave, and there's no money left over. When we came back from our honeymoon, my wife and I, we had a couple of bucks left. We bought a dog. He was a Scotch Coley, came from a farmer away off, I don't know where, but he sent it on the train and he made a little container, a little box, and there he sent it and we picked him up and I went to the train station and there was my little lassie. He couldn't stop his tail wagging. He was so happy to meet his new dad. Well, that was my example. The example that I'm just telling you here in the Bible is a parable that kind of strikes a note and it kind of hits all of us. It's a picture of our imagination because it does get our attention. The dream of the kingdom of God has moved men's minds for years. What's his kingdom like? Haven't you ever thought of that? It's always the same deep yearning. If we could only find the story and somebody would come back from over there and tell us what it's like. Well, someday that mystery of suffering and the mystery of sorrow and the extreme loneliness and the graves and the tragedy, if we're going to see it. And it won't be until the hereafter, however, and it's not then until we'll find the answer. Well, I'm going to look at three things today in this story. I'm going to talk about the king. I'm going to talk about the invitation. And then we're going to look at the response. First, the king. In this parable, 
It's an altogether different world that's going to emerge when you read the story about this wedding feast. The cost of the wedding feast isn't even mentioned. There's no mention made of the decorations. We don't know what the room was like. Where did they set the chairs? Where were the tables? Where were the flowers? Don't know. There's nothing mentioned about the ceremony. The bride and the groom, they're not mentioned. It's his sons, but we don't know anything about them. What the writer does talk about is the kingdom of God. It's not a state. It's not a condition of the world. It's not an ideal order of nations and life. Rather, it just simply centers around a king. And that's what the story is all about. Now, let me tell you what happens in the parable. The king is giving a wedding banquet. He's preparing a feast. You and I were invited. We're going to come as free guests. We're not paying to get in. It's just coming as a goodwill free gift to go to a party. The very fact that God should invite us to the table is really a miracle. Always keep in mind, the drama of Calvary and the institute of the divine grace that he has given me is beyond our understanding. Never take for granted or second nature how supernatural that really is. This is the story of a king. And behind all of this plan, there's something very supernatural that's going on that we can't explain. And it's really outside of our control, but it's happening. In my class here at church, we have a man who told the story of his father and his mother, and he and his sister when they were just young, a way back then. It's really supernatural when I read that because that's why I want to put it into the middle of this talk. The man's name was Jake Sayre. He loaned me a book, and in the book he wrote the story of his father's escape from Eastern Europe back into freedom. It begins, and it's kind of repeated all over again, what's going on in the Ukraine. Because those people in the Ukraine have been invaded by the same enemy, the Russians, and they're fleeing for their life. Almost 6 million of the 42 million that leave, live in Ukraine have fled because their cities are being bombarded. Anyway, in this story, Jake's father's name is Jacob, like his, and his mother's name is Anna. They're fleeing on horse and wagon with their children. And they want to get safely back into Germany. They speak German, but he also speaks other languages, his father. But they got caught in the enemy territory before they reached safety. And this is what that book is all about. They were arrested. They were marched into a large walled schoolyard, fenced in with a big gate. The inside, when they got, the gate was closed. They were removed from their wagon and their horses, and they were separated with all their belongings. So they lost their horses, their wagging, wagon, and all of their belongings. They had nothing but the clothes on their back. They were traveling with a trek of others who were fleeing. So there was safety in four or five other families. They were all urged into this courtyard. Among them were three young German soldiers. They were singled out and they were brought forward and got on their knees and they were teased and they were ridiculed and they were tortured. And worst of all, the enemy took out their gun and they shot them dead right in front of all those other people who were watching, including Jake, who's writing the book. Jake and Anna and their kids were the last to leave the schoolyard. 
They had opened the gates and they said, all right, the rest of you, away you go. And when they went out, they had to go left and they had to go into the forest. And Jake writes in the story that he heard screaming, he heard gunshots, he heard crying, he heard wailing, and then suddenly he heard nothing. There was no more sound. A young officer came and approached Jake's dad and demanded that they leave the yard right now. Jake's dad said, no, we're not going. If you're going to shoot us, kill us right here in the, in the schoolyard. We're not going out there in the forest and be massacred. Do it now and get it over with. Let me tell you the words that come along next out of Jake's book, because these are his words now, as he tells a story. Having heard that, the officer demanded to see Jacob Sayre's identification papers. He produced his Romanian cavalry passport with picture. On inspection, the officer started speaking to Mr. Sayre in Romanian rather than Czechoslovakian. How did you get here? How many are you? Whereabouts are you going? Mr. Sayre said, we're heading home. That's all we're doing. My wife and my children are coming with me. We're going home. The officer disappeared, went into his barracks, and he came out, and he had a sealed envelope. He said to Mr. Sayre, my parents are in a village just up the way. I want you to find them and give them this envelope. He then gave them a letter of safety. It was a letter of safe conduct to show anyone who might impede their trek that they were not enemies, they were simply going home. And then that officer did the strangest thing. He gave them a little wagon and two mules. They belonged to those three German officers who had just been shot in the courtyard. He gave orders for the gate to be opened. And he said to Mr. Sayre and his wife and kids, don't go left. When you get out of the gate, Go right. So they left. And they left unmolested. They left with only the clothes on their back. That little wagon and those mules took them all the way home. At night, they had nowhere to stay. And they slept underneath with what clothes they had on. That wagon. That wagon became their tent. But Jake tells a story how this was supernatural because whoever that officer was in the schoolyard, he never knew him, never saw him again. The others had been sent out and they were all massacred. That became a death trek. No one came out of that group alive except Jake and his wife and those two little kids. They reached safety, they did get home. Jake tells in the story that the king was watching over them. Something very special happened. They were Christians, and they knew that God's hand was upon them. They had been invited to the feast, and they said, we'll come. And they made it safely home. The kingdom of God is like a king who threw a wedding banquet for his son. Well, that's the king. Now, let's look at the invitation. He sent out his servants to call the invited guests, and they wouldn't come. Now, this invita invitation, it's not a hard piece of literature to read or understand. It's quite simple. No one is asked to come to this wedding feast to report for service. They're guests. This isn't a draft card. This isn't some categorical imperative. 
It's just simply, come on, I've got a party for you. Will you come? It doesn't come as a duty. It wasn't made as a law. God addresses us as his friends. We're his guests. He comes to us with a royal donor and he gives us that special gift. And the invitation to the wedding feast is, come. And what's the reaction? It says, they wouldn't come. They turned down the invitation. Well, what does the king do? Let me read on, verse 4, Matthew 22. He sent out another round of servants, instructing them to tell the guests, look, everything is on the table. Everything. It's ready for you. The prime rib is ready to be carved. Come to the feast. What was their response? The invitation was turned down. They only shrugged their shoulders and they went off, one to weed his garden, another to work in the shop, and the rest with nothing better to do, they beat up on the messenger. The invitation was given, everyone was told, and then there's this response. The king's messenger gave a joyful invitation and the response was monstrous. They can believe it. No, we're not going to come. If you read the Luke response to the same story, chapter 14, the Bible says they made light of it. They began to beg off one after another, making excuses. That's the Luke account. That's when the king said, quickly, I want you to go out into the city streets and I want you to get into every alley. And he called all who looked like they needed a square meal, all the misfits, all the homeless, all the wretched, Find everybody you can lay your hands on and bring them here because I have a banquet. I have a question for you, class. What excuses do you make when you're invited to the party? Well, I've got a business letter I've got to write. I'm so far behind with my bedding out plants, can't come. I got a cocktail party I've been invited to. I have a conflict. I'm going to that one. I'm buying a car. I got an appointment at the showroom. <clears throat> I'm using up my air miles. I'm heading off to Victoria. My financial advisor is taking me out to the cottage. I got a hair appointment and then I'm going to go and see my daughter. I got tickets to the hockey game. All of these. Class. All of these that I've just mentioned are more important, the invitation to the king's banquet. Have you ever notice how harmless our priorities are that acquire false importance? Easy excuses. In other words, people in this parable are really no different than you and me. Nothing has changed over all this time. Don't we want fulfillment? Aren't you looking for a special invite? From time to time, you might get one, but apparently not. Nietzsche, the German philosopher who was an atheist, he used to poke fun at Christians. Here's what he said. You Christians have to look more redeemed if I'm going to believe in your Redeemer. I'm going to tell you the story of a man who was invited to the king's banquet and he accepted the invitation. It all happened in a medical room far, far away. The invitation involved three men. They all went to the banquet when they heard the invitation. And it all starts with one man, and his name was Dr. Boris Alexander Kornfeld. He was a Jew. He was living in Russia in the 1930s. It was during the Stalin regime. One day, soldiers came to his clinic in Moscow, and they tied his hands behind his back. 
They blindfolded him and they led him out to a waiting military vehicle. And they drove off and he protested to the officers, but they didn't answer him. He was driven to the train station, wearing only the white clinical uniform that he had in the hospital. He was taken to the Siberian wasteland, hundreds of miles away from Moscow. His destination? They called it the Russian Gulag. And there he spent the rest of his life. This is when the story gets interesting. Because he was a surgeon, he was made the department head of surgery for the ward hospital in that gulag camp. He treated and performed surgery on all his fellow prisoners. One prisoner in particular didn't mention his name. He was treated by Dr. Kornfeld, but he had a remarkable character and he had a remarkable passion. He was unlike most prisoners who came into the clinic. He didn't speak evil of his condition. He didn't put down his guards. He didn't even complain about his food, although most of them in there were malnourished and all of them were starving to death. He didn't speak of ever getting out. He didn't even complain about his bed. He didn't have a mattress. All he did was sleep on boards. He didn't feel sorry for himself because he was so thin and so sickly. That's why Dr. Kornfeld was treating him. He was so malnourished. But the doctor was so impressed with this man. When he treated him, he couldn't figure him out. The man finally told Dr. Kornfeld when he was asked, why do you have this personality? You are such an oddball. You're so different than all the other prisoners. What makes you tick? The man looked at Dr. Kornfeld and he said, maybe it's because I'm a Christian. To which Dr. Kornfeld asked, I wish I could be like you. Could I become a Christian being a Jew? The prisoner said to him, I want you to repeat after me a prayer that my master taught me. So he taught him the Lord's Prayer, Our Father would art in heaven. When he finished, Dr. Kornfeld asked the prisoner, Can you forgive those who trespass against you? The prisoner said with a deep smile, The Lord Jesus forgave me. I find it easy even when I'm here because he wants me to be his example. The prisoner was removed from that camp. Dr. Kornfeld never saw him again. But that night, when Kornfeld went to bed, he couldn't sleep. All night he tossed and turned in his bed. He couldn't help but remember the words of that prisoner. They just seemed to burn deep down in his soul something that he couldn't pass. That night, before he awoke in the morning, he got down beside his bed on his knees and he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. Being a Jew, hearing what that prisoner said, having the invite to the banquet, he said, I'll come. But his job wasn't complete. Dr. Kornfeld's life had changed. Even though he never saw that prisoner again, he became a new doctor. And in that wicked prison camp, with torture, starvation, death all around him, one day into that surgery, there came another prisoner. He suffered this time from cancer, not malnutrition. Dr. Kornfeld did surgery on him and removed the cancer. The man was to heal. The surgery was successful. Do you know what that prisoner's name was? Alexander Solzhenitsyn. When he was released from the gulag, 
He did recover from surgery, and he became the famous prison uh, Russian author who told the truth about Stalin's horrific camps and the torture chambers. By the way, there were more millions put to death in that gulag in Stalin's camp than there ever, ever was with Hitler's Holocaust camp. That's hard to believe. Both Stalin and Hitler were monsters. Solzhenitsyn got the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1970. In his book, The Gulag Archipelago, written in 1973, which became a New York Times bestseller, he tells the story of his conversion to Christianity. Here's a description. I'm just going to quote it now from his book. Following an operation, I'm lying in the surgical ward of a camp hospital, and I cannot move. I'm hot. I'm feverish. But nonetheless, my thoughts don't dissolve me into delirium. I'm still awake. And I'm eternally grateful to Dr. Boris Nicholas Kornfeld, who's sitting beside me, right next to my cot, keeps talking to me. We talked all evening after I came out of the anesthetic. The light had been turned out, so it was dark. It didn't hurt my eyes. There's no one else in the ward but him and me. Fervently, he tells me the long story of his conversion from Judaism to Christianity. How he became a convert. I can still hear the ardor of his words. We knew each other very slightly. I didn't know Dr. Kornfeld, but he did my treatment. But there was simply no one here with whom he could share that story, so he decided to tell the story to me after I came out of my surgery. I was awakened in the morning by a running about and a trampling in the corridor. The orderlies were carrying Dr. Kornfeldt's body to the operating room. He had been dealt eight blows to the skull by a plasterer's mallet. While he slept, there on that operating, Dr. Kornfeld never left the operating room. He died without gaining consciousness. And so it happened. Dr. Kornfeld's prophecies were the last words on earth that I ever heard from him. Words that lay upon me an inheritance that I will never lose. You can't brush off the kind of inheritance by shrugging your shoulders. He had invited me to a feast and I accepted the invitation. I came to the park. Solzhenitsyn became a Christian because of Kornfeld's words. He survived the prison camp, became a writer, and he became one of the most influential believers probably of his day. Imagine the conversation of just one evening changed the direction of Solzhenitsyn forever. What have I told you? Three men were invited to the king's wedding feast. One we don't know his name. He told how he had been invited and he was coming. One was Dr. Kornfeld, the Jew who became a Christian. And the third was Alexander Solzhenitsyn who became Russia's greatest writer. Well, you know, there's a verse in the Bible in Romans 8 and 28, I says, it never fails to operate. We know that all that God causes, he causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. One person made a difference in each of these men's lives. The king invited him to the banquet. The kingdom of God is like a king who threw a wedding banquet for his son and he sent out his servants to call them in, and they were all invited guests. Class, you're all invited 
to that prime rib celebration. Go. It'll be the best wedding feast that you've ever attended. I'll look for you next week. Come on back to Discovery Class. Thanks for coming with me today.